Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in for our take two of demand management in CLC's webinar. My name is Semi Cooper. I'm one of the sector sustainability coordinators at Community Legal Centres Queensland and I again would just like to thank you for your patience and apologies for last week's trial one which obviously um, didn't work. Now before we begin I would firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are holding today's webinar in Mianjin or Brisbane. They are the Turrbal and the Yagara people. We wish to pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that these are stolen lands and that sovereignty was never ceded. This webinar will be viewed by people across Queensland and Australia and we also pay respect to the traditional owners throughout the country and extend a warm welcome to any First Nations people listening today. I will be presenting today on demand management and how we have tackled that project in the last 18 months in the Queensland CLC sector. Community Legal Centres Queensland or CLCQ was funded by the Department of Justice and Attorney General to lead the development of a demand management framework to support Queensland CLCs to implement and or improve existing intake and triage and demand management systems. In an environment where we know demand for services almost always exceeds capacity and where government funding requires centres to target their services in Queensland, that's through the NLAP, to the most vulnerable and disadvantaged clients. This will cover um, lessons from and scope of the project, the importance of data and the role that played in the demand management project and how this was used to implement um, Power BI's in Queensland CLCs that comes, uh, comes directly from class. It will also give an overview of the tool suite created by CLCQ for centres to implement, including a demand management framework, conflict scripts, uh, template emails and scripts for frontline staff, problem identification and Power BI resources. I certainly hope you enjoy this and if you do have any questions or you would like to talk to the CLCQ team about anything that comes up throughout this webinar, please feel free um, to get in touch with us. So for now, I will just run through our slides and I'll go through um, hopefully as much information as we can cover and if there's anything at the end, then feel free to email me. All of my contact details will be at the end. So through this, we'll go through um, the project, a little bit about what is demand management and how we got to that, problem identification, identification, change management, data, and some of the tools. The problem identification will be really critical in this webinar, and hopefully we can get a little bit into why that was so important, but critical thinking and creating space and time for accurate data was certainly one of the things that the feedback from our trial sites or our centers um, came through really strongly. The importance of involvement from management and ground staff in change management for buy-in and to ensure that this project was adopted as part of the culture or as part of um, business as usual. All of the tools that we'll be showing you today were actually tested by our trial sites, um, but there's certainly things in here um, that we're happy to share copies of and um, if you do need any of those, they're on our website, but I'll certainly go through that right at the end. So the project was funded by the De Queensland um, Department of Justice and Attorney General. It was supported and run by CLCQ and Clarity Consortium, who are a consulting firm here uh, based here in Brisbane and through an action learning process where we had four trial sites and we also had five buddy sites. And they all participated um, with one management person and one person from an administration or an operational role to ensure that we had insights from the top and we also had insights coming through from the ground. That was really important to us and I think that was probably one of the primary reasons for the success of this project. Um, it was really critical that we had the insights and perspectives from on the ground and I think we all know that just adding an extra team of volunteers is really not going to solve this demand management problem, um, if we're being honest with ourselves. And then even if we had all the funding in the world and we added an extra 10 lawyers to every centre, it's not necessarily going to change the problem. The problem at the moment is that we um, certainly have not been able to keep up with the demand for services or the increasing complexity of some of the 
legal matters that we have come through. So not only are we seeing more clients um, who are suffering from more complex legal problems, um, our funding is not aligned to that and certainly some of our systems and processes are not really kept up to um, any of that either. We haven't really made the time to stop and pause and look at exactly what this next slide is, which is what is demand management. So across this project, we aim to address initially the intake and triage systems in CLCs to help see if we could help with that um, frontline or whoever's on the phone or whoever it might have been in the beginning seeing the bulk of this increase in demand. So we had a mind to developing with CLCQ um, practical resources and tools. The problem was certainly most visible at intake. So we had people who were una um, unable to keep up with demand and a lot of unmet legal need. So the starting point for the project was that centres wanted to fix their intake processes and triage, train our frontline workers and see what we could do to best maximise our user resources at the front end. Our first step was to query that and actually reorient the project to think about the bigger picture because changes at one point in the client journey certainly have impacts downstream. And what we found was even at a resource level, we just weren't utilising what was already in our centres in the best possible way. So triage we identified as who gets in the door and demand management was who gets in, everything else that happens next and then what does it take? So we found that in some of our centres, lawyers were still triaging. So we had kind of everybody who needed a service um, was tried to be accommodated in our CLCs, which um, on one hand was obviously really helpful, but on the other hand was really unhelpful because we found that by the time the client got through all of the different intake processes or the triage processes, they might get to the lawyer at the other end and find that actually this is not a legal problem we can help with or actually this is not a legal problem at all. You you know, we need to link you in with a lot of wraparound services, but the legal problem is not the core problem and that this might not be something that a CLC could help with. So I guess we could think of it as um, triage is kind of an accident and emergency department and demand management was looking at where our resources are best fit or best place to fit. So demand management was driven by the organisational vision and strategy. It's much broader than the point of intake, and that's a really important point. Um, it considers the effectiveness and the efficiency of the stage of the client journey, and it's really got to be aligned with the vision and the strategy of the organisation. It considers a skills mix and the resources available, as we mentioned before. It aligns to providing services to the most vulnerable, which requires really a clear strategic direction from the top of the organisation, which is why it was so critical that we had one management and one intake or frontline or administration or organisation um, worker. And in addition to the process and system redesign, so it needed to involve at some level kind of service workforce redesign and thinking at a really high level about where this project fits into each level of the organisation and how we might best be placed to empower all of our workers across the organisations. So initially when we first started looking at what was happening in the sector, um, the access to initial services was not tightly restricted. Main client filtering occurred at an initial appointment, as we mentioned, with a lawyer who are probably not best placed to be um, filtering out clients that we want to be using our lawyers to be providing legal advice. Access to further assistance was informed by um, professional judgment and policies rather than tools or processes. Centres were dealing with problems in isolation and we found that across the sector actually they're quite similar regardless of the size of the organisation or sometimes even the location or whether or not they're specialised or generalist. Um, a lot of the problems were quite similar and there was really no communication across the sector about how each centre was handling each of those things. We didn't have a way to easily analyse data and certainly our data wasn't well used. Um, anybody who has used class before knows that it's come a long way, but potentially without some assistance, um, those class reports are quite clunky and quite difficult to interpret or use in an um, easily digestible way. 
centres were time poor and really struggled to create space to think deeply about solutions. It was all um, really based around trying to fix whatever the problem was that was arising rather than coming up with um, deep solutions or meaningful solutions. And one of uh, the strongest points across our sector is that there's a real strong culture of reflective practice and commitment to improvement that's based on um, practice knowledge. We really are the experts in CLCs. So this played out in CLCs by changes tending to be reactive and made on the run. As we mentioned before, potential impact of changes couldn't be easily modelled before making decisions. An example of that might be that um, rather than saying, look, we're not going to do um, wills and estates anymore and we think that that's going to free up 20% of our clients' space or our availabilities, um, there was really no way of being able to model this to see whether or not it's actually going to have an impact on availability. Centres had limited experience evaluating the impact of changes and lessons from successes and failures weren't being captured and shared across the sector. So our problem identification stage, we had meaningful data supported by Action Learning, which was done um, by Clarity Consortium, who did an amazing job. We had practical tools and processes all developed in-house by CLCQ. And we identify a problem or opportunity to support better demand management, which was informed by data, trial new approaches using tools and processes. And that was all done by four trial sites and supported by five buddy sites. So the demand management strategy set out to solve a problem related to demand for services in alignment with the organization's vision and their purpose informed by good data, which actually ironically came out of class. We um, paired it with a Microsoft product called Power BI, and I'll show you right at the end um, some of the examples of where that's up to in Queensland. So the data um, most relevant to the issue and the data that was complete and accurate was a really important part of this. So we did look at um, the data that was being input across all of the organisations and it really helped them to see where this was working and certainly shows where it's not working. Um, we also use client feedback and um, looking at where our resources go and for who and which services and which legal matters and how that aligns with the current strategy. It involved um, defining the problem and certainly testing the solution. That was um, a lot of active staff involvement. Um, we really put a lot of work into developing good baseline data. And we realized, I suppose, a key learning was that when you can't easily work with your data, you're not likely to invest energy into questioning any of the data that you're collecting because you can't do much with it anyway. So, if nothing else, I think our centers walked away um, with much more understanding or much clearer understanding about why we were inputting data. Um, because when you can access it and you can test your data easily, much more likely, I suppose, to consider the question of what's useful and relevant to collect. So we certainly never asked centres to start collecting data that we weren't going to use. That was a really important part. We're not just collecting data for the sake of it. Um, and centres are now, I suppose, starting to explore their own data and get a better understanding of where the resources are going with Power BI because you can analyse it by multiple variables um, and do that simultaneously. And you can get a picture of time spent, um, client characteristics, repeat versus one-off clients, um, matter types and service types. Um, and I suppose it's limited only by the quality of the data that you collect. So there really is... Um, a strong motivation for trying to sort out some of the data collection issues that you might be facing. Um, and some, some centres, sorry, started collecting data in addition to what we had as a baseline. So they started collecting um, time spent, uh, reasons for referral rather than bulk referrals, um, reasons for repeat appointments, and data that told us a little bit about the, ch the client churn or the system churn even, the sector churn. Um, so we were asking the number of other services that clients had approached first um, and did you get advice from another centre about this matter? So we were really able to see how clients were being passed around a bit of a, a roundabout, I suppose, and it's really easy to see why clients might feel a bit overwhelmed or a little bit lost when you realise that actually they're talking to kind of 
four or five centers at each time and kind of getting different answers or um, different availabilities and it can be quite an overwhelming process. The next um, area we looked at was change management. So we need a contribution from both management and the executive team and the administration or the frontline team. So a key component of this project was ensuring that we had the right people in the room and that we were able to have really effective conversations about all levels of demand management um, as well as just intake and triage. So all centres had the CEO or um, the principal solicitor or the principal lawyer and an admin officer or the office manager in the room. And we also had a great opportunity um, to test some of the solutions with Power BI before it was implemented. So they invested time in identifying what would be most useful for centres to know um, or make more informed service changes and then identified how much data could be easily accessed with minimal kind of impost on some of those services. Um, so we were able, for example, with Power BI to go back to the wills um, and estates scenario, we were able to select all of the services provided throughout the year minus the wills and estates matters and realise that actually it's only taking up about 1%. So it wouldn't be useful um, to cut that. It's not going to have an impact on the demand for services that we thought that it might. So the existing data um, were client characteristics compared with local demographics. Um, service and problem types, proportion of new versus repeat clients, client experience of the service, client satisfaction. With Power BI, we were also able to see um, seasonal demand trends, which is really helpful when you're doing things like workforce planning. For example, family law matters are quite likely to go up um, through school holiday periods. We had new versus repeat clients by client characteristics, problem type, um, service type and number of actions. And this will all make a little bit more sense as we start to go through some of the Power BI stuff which is coming up. And service intensity. So we defined service intensity um, by the time spent by number of actions, by number of problem types, by client characteristics. So one of the key arguments I think for us going through um, government funding advocacy at the moment is really trying to clearly articulate that it's not just an increase in the number of clients that we're seeing come through the door. It's also the number of legal matters they have. It's also the complexity of those legal matters. It's also the time spent on each of those matters. And it's also the levels of vulnerability or the client characteristics. So all of those things are contributing to our CLCs really feeling the increase in intensity. And so it was important for us as a group to be able to really clearly define what that means so that we could start to measure it. So the new things we have now almost been able to um, lock in with class and Power BI is the unmet demand, so which was um, analysis of referrals due to capacity, um, headcount of clients who drop off waiting lists, um, missed call data, turn away headcount. So only if you're collecting referral reasons or reasons for referrals are you able to um, really analyse some of that. And it was certainly motivating for centres who originally were going through um, just doing bulk uploads into class and realised actually that's good for reporting purposes, maybe to the Department of Justice, but it's actually pretty useless data without being able to kind of drill down into why that's happening. And we also were able to look at the client churn across the sector. So how many centres did you approach before getting a service here? And we're really surprised by the number of people who really were on a bit of a CLC roundabout. They were having to see two or three at a time, um, depending on their area or conflicts and that kind of thing. So it's certainly something that the public was feeling that we weren't aware of um, and I suppose it can be equally challenging for CLCs who are kind of dealing with um, some of these issues as they started to come up. The data made it really clear. So we're going to start moving into um, Power BI and looking at 
what some of this means, I suppose. Um, so this was taken from one of the original trial sites that we um, tested some of the Power BI work with. So as you can see on the left-hand side here, they are all the things that you're able to see um, across the different pages. You can separate all of those things out. Um, priority groups and service types, one-off first repeat clients, time spent. We then have um, time spent by client vulnerability, problem types, problem types by time spent, and it kind of goes through the, in that kind of vein. And as you can see on the right-hand side are filters. So we're able to filter all of that in real time. And I'm not going through one of our center's profiles in real time because I'm really conscious that um, I don't want to be showing their live data on a webinar, but I'll take you through some more of the screen so that you can see how those filters will work. Um, so you can filter by a center link status, by um, how many centers they approach before reaching us, by average and Torres Islander status, by disability, um, by age, there's kind of everything that you put into class about a client is a filter that you can use once it's all set up. So this is a look at the time spent overview. So all of the pages are the same. The filters in this case are the same. So you can't see any more of them. And you just have to take my word for it. But here we're looking at time spent overview. So we're able to see in a really practical way how much time is being spent on legal advice, um, on duty law services, on courts or tribunal services, and discrete non-legal tasks and referrals. And we're able to see um, here in the green uh, number of services and then in the blue um, the average number of problem types, which I think for us was really helpful um, because, again, it's just about how we can make that argument in an articulate way to government that actually we might be seeing one client and that might only count for one stat, but that one client might have three or four quite complex legal matters happening for them at any one time. This next page goes through the client characteristics and gives a kind of a bit of a snapshot level. Um, so this is the priority groups continued. So we're looking here at the Centrelink status, <coughs> excuse me, people who speak languages other than English, the disability breakdown, number of children, income sources and income levels. And again, you're able to filter all of this with multiple filters at any one time. And you're able to um, filter this by any date range that we want as well. The client churn question was a really interesting one. So had you received advice from another centre before? Um, this is very early on when we first started putting in the data. Um, and so I suppose it really, once all of the data started being entered, um, was able to show us the experience of clients and really start to paint a picture of that client journey. So the tools that um, CLCQ developed, there was about 16 tools that were trialled. Um, they included a client flowchart. They um, included the creating custom problem types in class and some guides around that. The demand management framework itself. We had email templates for responses that centres could use um, to try and streamline some of the administration tasks. A list for prioritising vulnerability. Um, measuring and managing repeat clients scripts for frontline staff to take away um, that kind of overwhelming feeling on the front counter when you're feeling like there's 15 phone calls waiting, um, managing conflict resources and a strategic planning toolkit. So this is an example of the email templates and we did liaise a lot with some of our um, key stakeholders in Queensland, like Legal Aid Queensland, who were really amazing at helping to provide some of this information. Their website's really comprehensive as well. So um, we were really grateful for all of the assistance that we got from the legal assistance sector more broadly and quite lucky that we work really cohesively in Queensland. Um, so this is an email template that was designed to help centres remind clients about what to bring. Some of the feedback was that 
we struggle to have clients turn up to appointments for whatever reason. Um, obviously, they're living incredibly complex lives at the time that they come into contact with the CLC sector. So we want to try and make that as easy as possible for them. Um, and sometimes when they do turn up, they don't have the things that are required. So they're unable to access legal advice on that day anyway. And we certainly don't want to be turning away people or delaying any of the legal matters any more than what they already are, we really want to be making sure that we're supporting clients as much as possible. So we went through and included all of the documents that are required for each of those legal matters on the right-hand side. That's just an example of some of the things. Um, we created standardised email templates for each area of law um, that the centres don't do so that they're not being booked into an appointment. Um, so we did get really detailed feedback from centres about the areas of law that they do and those that they don't do. And so for any area that they didn't do, we created an email template so that on the phone the person can say, look, unfortunately we don't do that area of law. However, we do have some information that I can email you rather than just having to say, no, we can't help you. This is an example of the client intake flowchart and um, I suppose used by centres to get a bit of a clear understanding about where each client was up to throughout the different phases of the inflow, the flow through or the outflow and what steps were required at each point. This was the demand management framework that we created and it was based pretty heavily on um, some of the health models that we did a lot of research into and that Clarity Consortium provided um, a lot of background information on. So the baseline information gathering, class data, uh, the NLAP, turnaways, the environmental mapping, defining the services, so the core business, the NLAP targets, and really looking at the vision, mission, operational planning of each organisation, how we would use the evidence to shape the core business and make any changes that we needed to make, which strategies and tools would implement, looking at whether or not that's managing demand and evaluating that. Heading over to the right-hand side, looking at consultation um, and identifying legal need of the community, identifying current services and gaps, and then monitoring and reviewing. So this really is a circular thing. This is not just um, a one-off. This is one of the scripts for managing conflicts and conversations. And this was developed in consultation with our sector about exactly what they need. So we gave um, scripts about verbal cues that they could use um, that were in line with um, the risk management guide, um, written examples, and then some of the statements that you can use to curb the curly, curly questions. Um, unfortunately, we do get a lot of those people who would like to know exactly why they can't be helped. And, um, the different escalation processes around that. So all of these uh, tools are on our website. So they are stored in PDF form so that people can kind of pull bits out and use what they would like to use. Um, so they are in our member section under organisational development. This is what the page looks like when you get to it. If you are listening and you don't have access to the website, please email me um, and I will work with our comms to see whether or not we can get you access or just get you copies of those. Um, so that's just a little bit about the project. And then down the bottom, um, you can see the scripts, um, email templates, demand management webinar, which will be this, um, and the client management resources. We also got a final evaluation report from Clarity Consortium about the project which might be helpful to use. Um, and I suppose the next steps for CLCQ. So we are investigating the viability of a template for CLCs um, from Power BI. So at the moment, um, even if you have Power BI, um, you will need to have access to a system developed in the back end um, to be able to talk to class. And at the moment, our centers are pulling their own reports and then dropping them into a OneDrive that then feeds into Power BI. So we'll be looking at whether or not that's the most efficient way to continue 
Um, we're working with interstate peak bodies about the learnings from their ICT projects and looking at options which ensure the longevity and the financial viability. Um, as a solution, we are really conscious that CLCs don't have a lot of money to continue to invest in brand new shiny things. And so CLCQ is really invested in making sure that whatever we are rolling out is um, feasible and financially viable. So this is potentially what one of our templates might look like. We are working with um, a local organisation at the moment who are helping us to pull some of these things into place. So this would be an example of how we would be looking at filtering um, homelessness status and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander status, the main language spoken at home, um, age at the time of the service. So this is quite similar to what the original um, Power BI looked like that I showed you in the beginning, but this one will be built off a web-based template so that we can kind of copy and paste it for all of our centers. Um, it will be a template plus approach. So CLCQ will have a kind of basics package, I suppose. Um, and then if centers do require more comprehensive reporting or they'd like to report um, multiple funding streams or that kind of thing, they can work with the organization to be able to do that. Um, that's not something that we'll be doing for all centres because some of our centres are quite small and just need to be able to um, report off class. So we do want to make sure that we've got options for every centre, um, regardless of their size. So people um, with multiple funding streams or who want to be able to report on more specific areas will be able to add, I suppose, to this template plus approach. This will be what our screens might look like um, for service types and delivery. This will be what the overview of services look like. So you can see that line through the middle is the number of services um, for each month in the year. This will be what the CLCQ peak view might look like. Um, we are not able to see specific data, which is exactly how we want it. We think it's really important for the integrity of the data um, and for the confidence of CLCs to know that we can't drill down into any of the data. We can only see really high level um, exactly what's kind of going on across the sector. We can't drill down into, of course, clients at any point, but even into centres. Um, we think it's really important that that's a really clear distinction between what the peak can see and what each centre can see. So each centre can only see their own data and the peak um, can't drill down into anything. And this is what we're able to pull together to see um, across Australia where all of our clients are coming from. Obviously, we would prefer to see where it's appropriate that um, all of our clients are in Queensland, but it does obviously depend on the individual circumstances. So that's um, a really clear way for us to be able to see exactly what's going on. And as you can see um, in the one, two, three, fourth column, of the purple bar graph at the top, this unknown becomes really clear when data is not being captured or it turns up in some of our graphs as blank. So it's really good to, for centres to be able to see exactly where the missing data piece might be. Um, this screen is the priority groups continued. Um, so this is looking at income level, Centrelink status, um, and again, income source blank is <laughs> something that you may or may not want to capture, but it's really easy to see that it's not being captured here. This is priority groups continued. So we've got a domestic and family violence indicator, um, the age at the time of the service, homelessness status, and of course you're able to um, drill down into any of these and cross-link them at any one time. So you might want to know for any First Nations people who are homeless and on Centrelink experiencing domestic and family violence, what proportion does that take up? For anybody with a disability who's also experiencing homelessness, what proportion of clients does that make up in our service? So we're able to um, cross filter any of these live at any one time. This one is um, the time spent. And I suppose that does require you to start capturing time again. And initially, um, we thought that it was really important that we gave that choice to centres. And I think each of our, all of our trial sites ended up going across to 
capturing time at least at some level so that we could prove again it's about how we're able to report the increase in complexity so we're able to see that some of these matters are taking up to four hours and you know we're looking at between six and eight thousand of our um, files looking that way across all of the years once you enter all of the data um, so we're looking at how much time court and tribunal matters take up how much time legal advices make up and Again, if we look right under the graph where we've got time spent by services on the right-hand side, blank, which is the red, um, ends up being a really big indicator about the fact that we are just not collecting some of this data. And that might be a choice um, of some of the centres, but um, it'd be a really easy thing to quickly fix once you've run a report to see actually we're not collecting this and maybe we want to start looking at that. So I think what this has done is really give centres an easier way to analyse their data and to really get into some of their data and figure out, you know, if we were to go back to this slide, if we were to run a clinic on um, domestic and family violence where homelessness is also happening for that client, um, how many clients would we be helping? You know, do we need to add an additional outreach clinic, for example? And we're able to filter all of this out and say, actually, yes, that would be useful. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, um, our original recording didn't work, but I am happy to answer any questions that you've got. Please make sure that you um, email me and we're happy to either reach out to you or um, for you to watch this or we can flick this email around. Um, this webinar around, sorry, and once you've had a look at the resources, if you do still have additional questions, we're more than happy to help. Um, my email's on the screen. And if there's anything else that you do think of or that you do want some assistance with, um, please reach out and let us know. But thank you so much for taking some time to watch this. And we really appreciate it. And we apologize for the tech delays. And we look forward to hearing from you soon and seeing you tune into the rest of the webinar program. Thank you. Bye.